This case has the potential to end the internet as we know it. The internet flourishes on user-generated content. It's the backbone of the internet. And if you write or say something that is illegal, you can be held liable for what you said. But usually the websites that host your content are not liable. And when you hear about Section 230, this is usually what we're talking about. But if websites were also liable for what users say, then websites would either shut down almost everything or police things so tightly that there would be basically nothing even remotely objectionable. Because if there's one thing that websites hate, it's being on the hook for billions and billions of dollars of potential liability and attorney's fees. And this isn't just some potential hypothetical. In the past, when laws made websites liable for user content, they just shut down the content and never came back. And one case before the Supreme Court this term seeks to do exactly that, but for all of the internet. No joke, this has the potential to end the internet as we know it today. So how did we get here? Well, it started with a tragedy. Noemi Gonzalez was a design major at California State University, Long Beach, who was spending a semester studying in Paris. On the evening of November 15th, 2015, she was dining with friends at a cafe on the Champs-Élysées when an ISIS terrorist with a gun opened fire. Gonzalez was killed along with 130 other people in coordinated attacks at six locations across the city. ISIS claimed responsibility for the attacks and eventually 20 men were convicted of crimes related to the massacre. The lone surviving gunman was sentenced to life without parole. So was justice served? Well, the Gonzalez family contends that it was not because there was another perpetrator still at large, YouTube. The family sued Google, which owns YouTube, alleging that YouTube's algorithms amplify violent videos and hateful content, despite the company's efforts to ban violent accounts and limit their reach. The Gonzalez family says that YouTube's recommendations expose people to hateful content, radicalize viewers, and encourage them to make terrorist attacks of their own. Google argued that because ISIS, not YouTube, made and uploaded those videos, YouTube was not the provider or developer of those videos, and therefore it was immune from liability under 47 USC Section 230, otherwise known as Section 230 of the Communication Communications Decency Act. Section 230 of the CDA immunizes internet services for the content that its users upload and often allows websites to remove content without taking on liability. But the Gonzalez plaintiffs contend that YouTube's recommendations should not be covered by Section 230 because the company is acting like a content creator rather than a publisher. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals held that the Gonzalez claims fell within Section 230 and Google was immune from suit. The Gonzalez parties appealed and the Supreme Court granted cert to answer the question of whether Section 230 immunizes an interactive computer service from liability for recommending other party content. Now, in support of their claims, plaintiffs allege that, quote, two of the 12 ISIS terrorists who carried out the attacks used online social media platforms to post links to ISIS recruitment YouTube videos and, quote, jihadi YouTube videos. One of the men who fired at Gonzalez had appeared in an ISIS recruiting video in 2014. Now, the plaintiffs argue that the defendants violated the Anti-Terrorism Act, the ATA, by allowing ISIS to post videos on YouTube. Under Section 2333 of the ATA, as amended by the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, Americans who are injured by, quote, an act of international terrorism that is committed, planned, or authorized by a terrorist organization may sue any person who, quote, aids and abets by knowingly providing substantial assistance or who conspires with a person who committed such an act of international terrorism and recover trouble damages. So the legal question in the lower courts was whether a social media platform that was not used to commit a specific, quote, act of international terrorism may still be liable for aiding and abetting under section 2333. The plaintiffs say that the answer is yes, that Google aided and abetted an act of international terrorism, conspired with the perpetrator of an act of international terrorism and provided material support to ISIS by allowing ISIS to use YouTube. And of course, the defendants say no, the plaintiff's claims are barred by section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which often immunizes interactive computer services, AKA uh, websites, even when they make targeted recommendations. The trial court and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals sided with Google, ruling that the claims fell within section 230, section C, because ISIS, not YouTube, created or developed the relevant content. The court said that YouTube, quote, selects the particular content provided to a user based on that user's inputs. The display of recommended content results from algorithms that are merely, quote, tools meant to facilitate the communication and content of others and not content in and of themselves. As the lower courts noted, the recommendations are based on the user's preferences, not YouTube's. Uh, the plaintiffs argue that Section 230C does not apply to, quote, activities that promote or recommend content. So let's dig deeper into what all of this means. 
First of all, the, the plaintiffs are not simply arguing that platforms are liable because terrorists have used their services. They argue that the powerful algorithms that recommend content are not covered by the CDA because the recommendations are content in and of themselves. And as the Ninth Circuit said, the complaint alleges Google uses computer algorithms to match and suggest content to users based upon their viewing history. The Gonzalez plaintiffs allege that in this way, Google has recommended ISIS videos to users and enabled users to locate other videos and accounts related to ISIS. And that by doing so, Google assists ISIS in spreading its message. So the plaintiffs claim that YouTube facilitates communications between ISIS and people who watch their videos, thereby aiding ISIS in recruiting new members. The plaintiffs acknowledge that YouTube removed ISIS videos and suspended or blocked ISIS users at various times. However, the plaintiffs claim that YouTube should have been able to stop ISIS from reestablishing accounts using new identities. And the plaintiffs allege that Google left some of the ISIS videos up because they did not contain content violating the site's policies. At other times, Google removed the offending content, but did not suspend or ban the accounts. Now we've talked about section 230 of of the CDA many times on this channel. Section 230 was created back in 1996 at the dawn of the internet. It has two key provisions. Section 230C1 says, quote, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. This sentence is often called the 26 words that created the internet. This section stipulates that providing access to third-party content does not make an online provider the publisher or speaker of that content. Now, the second major part of the law is section 230C2, the so-called Good Samaritan provision, which states, quote, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be held liable on account of any action voluntarily taken in good faith to restrict access to or availability of material that the provider or user considers to be obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable, whether or not such material is constitutionally protected. So this provision gives online platforms broad immunity from liability if they moderate content in good faith. This provision was meant to allow websites to police itself without incurring new liability because it was an issue of knowledge. A website might not know what speech was hosted on that particular website, in which case they wouldn't be liable for it. But if they knew that illegal speech or defamatory speech or some other kind of speech was hosted there and then took steps to remove it from the website itself, then they actively had knowledge of that particular speech and thus might become liable for hosting it in the future. So websites found themselves on the horns of a dilemma until section 230 of the CDA was passed to allow them to engage in good faith moderation. Because there was generally a knowledge requirement to be liable for things that were hosted on your website. If you had no knowledge of what kind of speech was on your website, site or a platform, then you generally weren't liable for it. But the argument went that if you started to moderate your website, then that was evidence that you knew what was on there and therefore you became liable for all the stuff that you were trying to remove from your website. And this applied to spam, to pornography, to pirated media, to uh, defamation, you name it. So the CDA was enacted in 1996 when the internet was still in its infancy. At the time, companies like America Online, CompuServe, and Prodigy were the portals that allowed people to access the internet. People could share files, exchange messages, and chat with each other in real time. But that posed a dilemma. Who would be liable if a user posted something defamatory or shared something else that was illegal? Would liability go beyond the person that was responsible for the post? Or would the internet companies who hosted the content also be on the hook? And that brings us to the distinction between content publishers, distributors, and platforms, which is often completely misunderstood. In the pre-internet age, publishers, distributors, and platforms were treated differently under the law. Publishers were newspapers, magazines, and broadcast stations. They were generally liable for republishing material from third parties since they solicited the things that they published and they could vet those materials. Distributors were businesses like bookstores, newsstands, and libraries, which distributed material that was printed by others. And distributors were not required to assess every book that they sold. For example, in the 1950s, the Supreme Court overturned a Los Angeles ordinance that said, if you have obscene material in your bookstore, you can be held criminally responsible. And in that case, a bookstore owner was convicted of violating the ordinance by selling a novel called Sweeter Than Life, which tells the story of a, quote, ruthless lesbian businesswoman. The Supreme Court said that the bookstore couldn't be responsible for reviewing every single thing in the book or magazine that it sells. And distributors only had liability if someone notified them that something they carried was illegal. That's 
sort of the origin of the knowledge requirement. And platforms were common carriers like phone companies and television broadcasters. Platforms weren't liable for third-party content that they carried. So for example, let's say AT&T found out that someone's answering machine had a libelous outgoing message. Was AT&T required to act by canceling the owner's telephone service? Well, the court said no, AT&T couldn't be sued for libel simply because the owner used its service to say something libelous. And similarly, a broadcaster wasn't liable for running a political candidate that falsely accused someone of being a communist. But then the internet came around and the internet era posed a new challenge for this case law. Two of the first internet service providers, CompuServe and Prodigy, were sued for hosting forums where users posted defamatory content. Now Prodigy billed itself as a family-friendly version of the internet. Did you get a computer recently? Well, congratulations. You can now join hundreds of thousands who've discovered Prodigy. It moderated comments, removing things it thought were bad. Now, CompuServe didn't moderate anything. CompuServe combines the power of your computer with the convenience of your telephone. And both of those companies were sued for defamatory statements that their users posted to the service. Now, the case against CompuServe was dismissed because the court considered it a distributor of content rather than a publisher. CompuServe could only be held liable for defamation if it knew or had reason to know of the defamatory nature of the content. And since they didn't do anything to moderate their forums, the company couldn't possibly know or at least argued it couldn't possibly know about what the denizens of Rumorville were posting about each other. But Prodigy was found liable for failing to moderate enough. Someone went on a forum and claimed that Jordan Belfort's investment firm, Stratton Oakmont, committed fraud in connection with a stock IPO. The firm sued Prodigy and the anonymous poster for defamation. And a court held that Prodigy was liable as the publisher of the content created by its users since it exercised editorial control over the messages on its bulletin board. Now, if the names Jordan Belfort and Stratton Oakmont ring a bell, that's because they were literally scamming people out of millions of dollars and have gone down as some of the biggest fraudsters in all of Wall Street history. The movie, The Wolf of Wall Street, is based on the fraud that they were perpetrating with respect to the IPOs. And it's one of the biggest ironies in all of First Amendment law that they won this lawsuit against the people that were hosting presumably accurate information about how they were scamming people out of money. That's part of the problem when websites are liable for user content is that People can file lawsuits to stifle speech. That's what a slap lawsuit is all about. And because lawsuits are incredibly expensive, sometimes even if you scammed people out of money, as long as you file a lawsuit, you can stifle that kind of speech. But I digress. As a result of these cases, internet service providers basically either decided to not moderate at all and leave absolutely everything up, or basically moderate everything and not allow anything to go up. And basically no one was happy with this state of affairs. So Congress enacted the Communications Decency Act. And then as now lawmakers claimed to be especially worried about things like harassment and obscene material. So they gave online providers immunity from lawsuits if they moderated content. And again, the irony here is that this legislation came from the sort of family values type politicians, the people who always want to think about the children. <laughs> They wanted to allow websites to remove violent and sexual conduct so that the internet could be even cleaner. The same politicians who wanted and got the little parental advisory explicit content warnings put on rap albums. But I digress again. Section 230 was intended as a way for internet companies to create and enforce basic standards to run their websites. And when the CompuServe and Prodigy cases were decided, the courts only considered whether the ISPs were publishers or distributors. But an internet service like a website didn't fit neatly into those categories. A traditional publisher has total control over whether to publish content. A distributor can control what it buys, but it wouldn't have been practical for a human to fully screen every item. Modern social media companies host more material than any library or bookstore on earth, which makes screening all of that info daunting if not impossible. And without Section 230, social media companies would be subject to strict liability for every message and post made on their services. So Congress chose to give those platforms and websites immunity as an incentive to get them to remove offending speech. Congress also chose not to dictate to those companies which speech they had to remove. So that brings us back to the original question in this case. How should courts read Section 230? The lower courts follow the test set forth in the Ninth Circuit case called Barnes versus Yahoo. And the Barnes test hews close to the text of Section 230. The law specifies that only one, no interactive computer service, shall be two, treated as a publisher or speaker, 
of three content provided by another information content provider, AKA users. Now the plaintiffs argue their claims do not treat Google as a publisher, but instead assert a simple duty not to support terrorists. They said that the ATA prohibits Walmart from supplying fertilizer, knives, or other material to ISIS. And in the same way, the ATA bars Google from giving ISIS a platform to communicate. The Ninth Circuit found this analogy specious. The idea of a duty not to support terrorists, quote, overlooks that publication itself is the form of support Google allegedly provided to ISIS. And publication of third-party content is what Section 230 gives to internet services. According to lower courts, publishing encompasses, quote, any activity that can be boiled down to deciding whether to exclude material that third parties seek to post online. Google says that the CDA uses the words publisher or speaker in an ordinary sense. Quote, based on an ordinary meaning, a publisher or speaker is one that publishes or speaks. Google contends that when YouTube's algorithms make recommendations, this activity is protected by Section 230. Quote, Congress underscored that publishing for purposes of Section 230 includes sorting content via algorithms by defining Defining interactive computer service to include tools that pick, choose, filter, search, subset, organize, or reorganize content. Congress intended to provide protection for these functions, not for simply hosting third-party content. And the plaintiffs disagree. Their interpretation of the Section 230C defense is that it requires a narrower interpretation of the word publisher. The Ninth Circuit previously held that Section 230C1 uses publisher in its everyday sense, and the Second Circuit agreed. But the plaintiffs contend that the word publisher is used in Section 230C1 with a narrower and distinct meaning, which that term has in defamation law. Basically, the plaintiffs are claiming that any time YouTube recommends another video, it therefore becomes the speaker of that video, as if YouTube had produced that video itself. Now, defendants say that this interpretation doesn't make sense. Quote, watch the World Series of Poker on YouTube and YouTube's algorithms might display Texas Hold'em tutorials. That does not mean that YouTube endorses gambling any more than Spellcheck endorses a suggested substitute word. Westlaw endorses higher listed cases or a chat room endorses posts organized by topic. As the Ninth Circuit noted, YouTube applies the same algorithms to all content. And it's here that I think people often misunderstand the nature of the internet and the nature of social media. With the case of YouTube, people upload millions of videos a day. If there wasn't an algorithm to sort through this uh, deluge of videos, the only way to sort through them would be a fire hose of viewing every video chronologically, which nobody wants. It would be that or doing a pointed search to try and find content, but then you'd never be exposed to content that you actually do want to watch, but didn't know that you wanted to seek it out. And the plaintiffs have tried to differentiate between search results and other algorithmically generated results, but there's really no principled way to distinguish between results that are sorted when you actively search for something versus results that are presented to you because of a recommendation algorithm. And people love to hate algorithms, myself included. But the truth is, if there weren't algorithms to help us sort through all of the content on social media platforms, it would be impossible to wade through it. And then additionally, there's the issue of the material support related for a claim under the Anti-Terrorism Act. Now, the Department of Justice's brief in support of the plaintiffs argues that algorithmic recommendations convey the website's own implicit message that users will find the information relevant. And that makes the website liable because it's acting just like ISIS itself. Now, plaintiffs didn't claim this in their original complaint. Instead, they focused on how YouTube's recommendations amplified the ISIS speech, making it more visible to more users. But the US government urged the Supreme Court to adopt a narrow reading of Section 230 that would permit a finding that Google materially contributed to the content by matching it to user preferences. Again, basically, the Department of Justice, as well as the plaintiffs, are arguing for a standard that if any website uh, promotes content, uses an algorithm, or recommends content to users, that that website then becomes liable for all of the speech contained within that recommendation. What happens when websites are liable? Well, remember I mentioned that this has actually happened before? Well, it has. In 2018, then President Trump signed into law two bills making it easier to fight sex trafficking online. That was the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act and the Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act, otherwise known as FOSTA and SESTA. And those two laws created an exception to Section 230's Safe Harbor Rule by stating that websites could be held legally responsible if third parties posted ads for prostitution on their platforms. The law penalizes websites which, quote, promote or facilitate prostitution. And while this includes sites that promote illegal sex work, it also allows the police to investigate any site that is knowingly assisting, facilitating, or supporting sex trafficking. This language can be read to include sites with content that is legal, such as escort services, personal ads, and pornography. 
Now, critics of FOSTA and SESTA warned that the new laws were too broad and they would end up killing internet content that has nothing to do with sex trafficking. And they turned out to be correct. If a third party posts content that is covered by FOSTA or SESTA and the website fails to prevent that content from being posted, that website can be sued. And that was simply too much legal risk for several websites. You should have gone for the head. Craigslist shut down its entire personal section. Tumblr banned all adult content and Reddit removed several subreddits and other websites just simply shut down entirely. So you might ask, did any of this assist with the prosecution of sex trafficking? Well, in 2021, the US Government Accountability Office released a report on the first three years of FOSTA and SESTA, finding that, quote, over three years, the Department of Justice filed just one case under its rules against promoting or recklessly disregarding sex trafficking. So ironically, this provided essentially the perfect natural experiment to find out what happens when websites are liable for the speech content of its users. One of two things will happen. Either the website shuts down that section or shuts down the entire department or the website employs an army of moderators to remove anything even remotely offensive. You basically either live in a world where a website allows everything, scams, spam, pornography, ultra violence, just everything that you can possibly imagine you probably don't wanna see in your everyday life, or you live in a world where they employ the extremely expensive moderators who prevent anything that might possibly be offensive. And that of course assumes that a website can even afford to employ those moderators. So there are those who want to see section 230 modified or scrapped altogether and have argued that these online services are acting like content developers. Now, oral argument in front of the Supreme Court is next week, and I'm putting my money where my mouth is on this one. I filed a brief in the Supreme Court along with Dr. Mike, Mythical Entertainment, Chubby Emu, Tim Schmoyer, and the Authors Alliance, and a bunch of other creators. We filed an amicus brief explaining the potential dire consequences of a really bad ruling on this, so we'll see how it goes. But in the meantime, I'll probably just be stress eating at the end of the internet. Uh, unless I use today's sponsor, Factor 75. Because Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. And the meals are completely ready to eat. Uh, their team of gourmet chefs creates each meal using ingredients with integrity to help you feel your best all day long. And I can tell you from experience, the, they really are extremely delicious. Factor supports wholesome eating made simple. Their menus are updated weekly with 34 different options. Choose your favorite meals or let Factor craft the order based on your taste preferences and meal history. Factor Factor takes the guesswork out of grocery shopping and meal prep, saving you time and energy for other things. Their no hassle prepared foods make sure you always have something nutritious on hand when you don't have time to think about making a meal. And sometimes I just want a good healthy meal without having to cook or obviously shop for the ingredients. And Factor's meals arrive pre-prepared and ready to eat in just two minutes. And I can always scale up my meals if I need the extra energy after a long day of lawyering. So give Factor a try by heading to factor75.com and use the code LegalEagle50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Or just click on the link that's on screen right now or down in the description and use the code LegalEagle50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. And clicking on that link really helps out this channel. And after that, click on this box over here for more Legal Eagle, or I'll see you in court.